You are listening to Shipwrecked in the Land of King Tobacco, the first Washington family immigrant to America, read by the author Nicholas D. Garrett. Chapter 1 Historians speculate about what occurred for the family of the Reverend Lawrence Washington between the early 1630s and 1640s, when his name reemerges in records, showing him hanging on by a thread, and England on the doorstep of civil war. While some specific events elude, the context of what was occurring in England at the time was well known and would have affected the Washington family. A partial freefall of the social order occurred during a growing period of anti-royalist sentiment. Many struggled to simply eat and stay healthy while others benefited from the monarchy's spoil system that rewarded loyalty and used nepotism to fill positions. John Washington no doubt saw this dynamic up close and personally. The entire population was affected by Archbishop of Canterbury William Laud's forced changes to religious practices across England, changes he himself would one day have to abide by and teach. In some ways it is hard to picture John Washington having much of a conventional childhood given those circumstances. In addition to the events occurring in his immediate community, news came from other parts of the world, too. Just a few years before John was born, the Black Plague had killed 250,000 people in Italy. What scientists now call the Little Ice Age was reaching its end, but still impacting crop growth in various parts of Europe and the world during the early part of John's life. Coupled with resurgence of belief in the supernatural that led to the killing of people deemed to be witches in John's very own community, daily life had to be a frightening prospect for a child. Perhaps no other fact better highlights the world into which John Washington was born than to note Galileo Galilei's greatest work, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, Ptolemaic and Copernican, was published and sent the religious world into an uproar first in Catholic Rome, and eventually Anglican England. The dramatically superstitious nature of religious leaders at the time compelled Galileo's house arrest for daring to suggest that the earth revolved around the sun. If John Washington was going to make it in that world, he likely had to grow up fast, possessing a sense of the reality of life and death that left little time for games and toys particularly as he got older and his father's position more tumultuous. It would appear that John did his part. Between the ages of eight and ten, it is probable that he completed some basic grammar and mathematics at home or at a community school. Just as his father had wished, John was ready for prep school. In 1640, the Reverend Lawrence found the royalist machinery still well enough at work when King Charles I showed favor on the Washingtons and awarded young John a scholar's place to Oxford. While he waited to enter university, he was sent to Thomas Sutton's hospital and school. It is not hard to picture Lawrence bending the ear of Sir William Laud to ensure his son's placement. In fact, those were the very trade-offs that Lawrence enjoyed, having been a good enforcer of Laud's wishes back at Oxford. The Washingtons and many families like theirs would soon receive a shock as the royalist spoil system underwent unprecedented strain. The Washingtons took advantage of the opportunity given John, and perhaps seeing the writing on the wall about what was coming, packed him up in 1640 for his trip to Sutton's school. John said his goodbyes at his family's home. His mother, Amphilus, and Andrew Nulling, his step-grandfather, who had helped see to his daily bread during the Reverend Lawrence's absence from home. Not only did Nulling influence John as a father figure, but also John's other siblings who had come along by the time John was leaving for school. His younger brother, Lawrence, had been born in 1635. Elizabeth, called Betty, was born in 1636, and Margaret in 1638. Another boy, William Washington, would come along in 1641, and the youngest, Martha, is believed to have come in 1649. 
The Washington family was large, to be sure, cousins, aunts, and uncles. John's maternal grandmother had died in 1637 when he was reaching school age. With his bags packed, John set out toward London. One wonders if Reverend Lawrence had come to offer well wishes to his firstborn as he encouraged him toward his destiny. About forty miles separated the family and Tring from Sutton School near London. Thomas Sutton's school employed a charitable model partially designed to offer several trade and collegiate pathways to students. Sutton's scholars had been admitted based on having been servants to the king's majesty, captains either at land or sea, soldiers maimed or impotent, men fallen into decay through casualty, shipwreck, or fire. Men with fascinating stories whose experience covered the vast trades of the world would have immediately surrounded John. Soldiers, sailors, and merchants comprised a faculty, a treasure trove of mentorship. Stories of swashbuckling and the building of contacts in every industry that existed for the benefit of teaching a new generation. Like most boys headed for school, John had to be excited about his new prospects. Most students had to wait until age 10 to begin at Sutton School. Perhaps like any child, John considered how he would fare. Was John homesick at all? Did getting away from the growing unrest and becoming one in a peer group that would eventually bind he and his classmates into a unique fraternity give him some comfort with the goings-on around him? After going through admissions, John, books in hand, began the education of a junior scholar awaiting his call to move on to Oxford. Far from feeling stigmatized for attending a school viewed as an institution for the poor, he likely felt some sense of security. At Sutton, he was fed, clothed, and instructed in classic learning, writing, and arithmetic at the sole expense of charity. Moreover, as a youth, he was not pressured to pursue any particular pathway. It was not until students reached the age of 15 that they were permitted and required to choose whether they would continue to a university like Oxford and Cambridge or begin an apprenticeship in one of a variety of trades, over 300 in London alone, not to mention the trades in the bustling ports of Bristol on England's west coast. George Gerard was the school's headmaster when John arrived in 1639 and 40. He stood at the head of the great chamber as the new students filled in on the first day. The opulence must have struck even the gentlemen's sons. Standing among the high tapestries and ornate vaulted ceiling, rich dark woods and chairs upholstered with deep crimson seats. Although All Saints, John's father's church was like that, Sutton's opulence may have been a bit less claustrophobic for John given his freedom there compared to back home, where his life's path seemed so predetermined in that environment. From the onset, John learned of the vital importance of service to others, a Christian principle upon which his entire education was built. Devotion to that principle manifested itself in John's daily reminders about the school's motto, Deo Dante Dedi, God having given, I give. Particularly since his father wanted him to study at Oxford and ultimately join religious life, service to others was a principle to which young John had given much thought. At the same time, there was a great contradiction at play in John Washington's observation about daily life and the world unfolding around him. Several complex issues were beginning to define daily life for the English while he navigated his first several years at Sutton's school. England was becoming more violent and tumultuous. Any vestiges of youthful innocence that John held on to left as England finally fell into all-out civil war. As the son of a royalist rector, he knew about the gains being made by the parliamentarians, to rub out the existence of men like his father. In fact, John was a student at Sutton School when the headmaster, George Gerard, was arrested in full view of the students, taken to the Tower of London, tortured, 
and killed for his royalist sympathies. Can a boy of roughly eleven or twelve piece together what such actions meant? Did he understand it in the context of his father's own struggles? Back near Perley, the Reverend Lawrence Washington spent each day tending to his congregation, even as it became more opposed to royalists. Seeing folly on both sides of the argument, he tried to be a unifying force. In a region that had become openly supportive of Oliver Cromwell and the parliamentarians in their attempt to overthrow the king, Reverend Lawrence maintained some trust among his parishioners. He served the sacraments, tended to widows, fed the poor, and tried to make sense of the violent times in sermons he designed to speak reason to his increasingly divided flock. That was a particularly striking fact and may indicate something about the Reverend's character. It is not hard to imagine Lawrence trying to do whatever it took to protect his family and their way of life, even if it meant setting his own personal views aside. Meanwhile, one wonders how Amphilus Washington fared as she cared for her young family in the midst of war. How was she coping with the family's decline? Did Miss Washington have opinions about the discontented mob growing in opposition toward the crown? Or the hatred for Laud's henchmen undermining Reformation principles in favor of a corrupted system similar to the one the church had just cast off? Many of these issues were the same ones she heard Lawrence talk about each time he came home, with further news of the divide. What good was her opposition or support? All she wanted to do was feed her family. Back near London, a routine had emerged for John with predictable patterns. Classes, lectures, meals, and the occasional frivolity with classmates. Even though the risk of violence right outside campus in London was ever-present. When possible, students spent their evenings devoted to studies and preparing for frequent showcases put on by Oxford and Cambridge. John would gather with his classmates as teachers and scholars gave lectures and led debates. At the time, Edward Pocock's talks on Hebrew and the Orient were wildly popular. In addition, they participated in the timeless tradition of referring to lesser aspirants like John as gown boys a harmless hazing that announced the students were on their way. Even as he increasingly ran among the intellectual elite during these debates, young Washington was beginning to have grave concerns about religious life and becoming a scholar. His strongest example, his father, was daily dealing with distress of changing beliefs in England, public criticism, and barely able to meet the financial needs of his family, if at all. It was John's mother and her stepfather that saw to the family's daily bread. Back in 1637, when Amphilus' mother died, she remained at the house in Tring, apparently with few options because of how little money the family had. Time had taken its toll on all of them. Now Parliament had been moving in a direction toward expelling men like Reverend Lawrence Washington from their positions across England. In 1643, a list of some 2,800 malignant royalists was put together and circulated through the countryside. The list contained 100 from Essex alone. The Reverend Lawrence Washington was number nine on that list. Such a damning public declaration put to rest for good the speculation as to his loyalty. That November, the charges against John's father came down. Lawrence Washington, rector of Purley in Essex, a common frequenter of alehouses, not only himself sitting daily tippling there, but also encouraging others in that beastly vice, and hath been off drunk and hath said that the Parliament have more papists belonging to them in their armies than the king had about him or in his army, and that the Parliament's army did more hurt than the Cavaliers, and that they did none at all and hath published them to be traitors that lend to or assist the Parliament. Up to that point, Reverend Lawrence had survived in his parish by attempting to minimize the benefit given to royalists, and by claiming that the parliamentarians were just as liable for the violence. While technically that may have been the case, the list brought such rage to the surface for some that Reverend Lawrence feared for his life. Consequently, Lawrence's remarks also showed how out of touch 
the comfortable gentry were with the struggles of the English commoner, loyally following Cromwell through the countryside. Some of Reverend Washington's parishioners stepped forward to defend him against the charge that he was off drunk. There is no question that he must have been well-liked because, in the face of the mass expulsion, he landed well enough on his feet in Little Braxted, a much smaller and poorer parish with even less money now to support his family. He could not bring them along, and he continued without them. Amphilus remained at her parents' house on Frogmore Street, even as Lawrence headed toward his new parish. It was not much of an adjustment to be sure, considering what the family had been through for a decade, and what they lost over the previous years, not the least of which was some claim to their family's opulent Saulgrave Manor estate, which really meant nothing to Lawrence as a middle child anyway. Now Amphilus would have to rely on anything she could to feed her family. Luckily, she could write, during a time when nine of ten women could not even sign their names. She weighed her options. Meanwhile, John had all but decided against Oxford. Could one really blame him in the face of events around him? Some reasons were obvious for his willingness to break with the tradition of primogeniture, while others were subtler. He found that he most enjoyed the stories of the older scholars at Sutton who had spent their lives at sea, trading, sailing, and seeing varieties of ports all over the world. The time was soon coming when John would have to decide. His fifteenth birthday was approaching, and he would have to choose Oxford or an apprenticeship in a trade. Back near Tring, Amphilus narrowed the options left for her to care for the rest of the family. Where could they go to be safe? Where could she earn money to feed them or at least get a spot of ground that would produce even some light crop? While the Washington still held land and position among royalists, this particular part of the family was poor of cash. Conditions socially and politically would not allow them to take advantage of any benefit. Needing a more robust solution, on that particular day, Amphilus Washington was swallowing her pride and putting Quill to paper. She would write a letter to her brother and ask for help. But Goodman Wastar has sent me word that if you will buy it, a property and home for their use, he will provide to go out as soon as ever he can. I would entreat you to take some pains in it for us by reason we have no constant being. Besides, there is land that I would not have lost. I pray, brother, take some care for us. Amphilus had every reason to fear for the safety of the family at Frogmore Street. If not soldiers from both sides of the conflict menacing townsfolk, superstition responding to Laud's pseudo-theology, mortality and the meaning of life, created a period of confusion and fear regarding things of the spirit. Supposed witches were hunted down and killed by the hundreds. Even though many knew no such thing to exist, Witch hunting still sparked the carnal instincts of the people and served on some levels for denominations to punish others as impure. The consequence was that the process of hunting alleged witches and subsequently killing them became a sort of folk entertainment. Back in 1646, up to 400 people in Essex alone, the Washington's own region had been murdered on evidence of having been witches. The leader was Matthew Hopkins, a folk hero figure known by the name of Witch Finder General. Highlighting the barbarity of his approach, a suspected witch named John Lowe was forced to walk continually without stopping for three whole days and nights under duress. The saga ended with him being forced to read his own funeral service in front of a frothing public mob, or so the story said. Most sickening is that many somehow saw justice in the public murder of these suspects. The hangings and torturing became grand public spectacles as a backdrop to the very real Civil War. John Washington witnessed firsthand these various sights, smells, sounds, and pains. He watched his parents' holdings, stripped away one after the other, his father on the run, and witnessed their struggles to regain the status they had once enjoyed. In and out of courtrooms, constantly embroiled in litigation, 
begging the king or calling in favors that landed Reverend Lawrence in an always smaller and poorer accommodation. Could his father really argue the benefit of his career to John in light of his own situation? Could pride in the family motto or their crest put food in John's belly or be of any avail when the value systems in John's life were at direct odds? While little is known about the details, John Washington ended up as a traveling merchant sometime between 1644 and 1655 and became known among other merchants as experienced and talented. The will of his step-grandfather, Andrew Nolling, does specify that John was living with his mother in 1650. Further, the laws of England themselves reveal with certainty what must have consumed at least part of John Washington's time. Under Statute 5, Elizabeth C. 3, it stated, No man could practice a trade unless he had first for a period been adequately apprenticed. It is no wonder John Washington completed his mandated apprenticeship and took to the sea instead of pursuing his father's wishes. Were the fears and uncertainties of sea travel of any account when compared to events John had already lived through? Whether witch hunts outside his mother's front door or having been at school just outside of London proper in 1643 when, during battle, the royalists pushed their foes back out of the city? From all these remarkable events, John emerged his own man, with his own ideas. The political landscape in the aftermath of the English Civil War had changed England and her people. The outcome had etched the Washington family on the losing side, albeit temporarily. There would be consequences for several generations of royalists, including John Washington and several of his siblings. Perhaps there was no one better prepared to take on the sea than the young men who came up in the bustling wartime city of London, reading from the constant barrage of new pamphlets and newspapers circulating from both sides. John would have likely gotten both views reading newspapers like the Roundhead's Parliament Scout and Weekly Intelligencer. He would have gotten the royalist view from publications like Mercurius Olicus. Since everything the Reverend Lawrence had been given was because of his loyalty to the crown and his connection to famous siblings, it was easily taken away when the parliamentarians figured out how to fill the power vacuum they were creating by overthrowing the monarchy. John must have seen how powerless his parents' way of life really was during his formative years. Two mottos had been at the forefront during John's childhood and as a teenager. His family motto, the act proves the deed, and God having given, I give. In reality, young Washington had seen deeds done to no avail, and other deeds done for many seemingly undeserving. He had also seen God take away. John may have tried to hold on to those mottos firmly in the face of such changing times, he was, after all, not the only one being affected. A solution for thousands of men was to make their way to the British colonies in North America. English royalists increasingly heard stories about opportunity in merchant trade. Cavaliers set sail across the Atlantic and boosted the decimated numbers of settlers that saved Jamestown after Chief Opachenkano and remnants of the Powhatan Confederacy killed over 300 of their ablest men. The king also issued grants to seat land on which large families settled plantations all throughout Tidewater, Virginia. More than a grand vision, these actions by the crown were perhaps misidentified. Preoccupied with her own issues and Unwilling to take a place with the other developing countries from a cultural perspective, England had fallen behind. Wedged in a power struggle with the Dutch and burdened by her own anti-Catholic sentiment, she held to her staunch beliefs to the extent that the rest of the world had altered their ways of life to the more capitalist view, that the unity of trade and benefits of economy should supersede all else. 
With Cromwell unable to gain an organized set of laws for England, he was unable to focus on the globalization and colonizing taking place among other nation-states. English colonization during this period was at least driven by individuals seeking opportunity for themselves. Not until later, after the restoration of the monarch, was speculation toward new streams of revenue and attempted expansion of influence a motive for North American colonization. Thank you for listening to Chapter 1, Read Aloud, of Shipwrecked in the Land of King Tobacco, The First Washington Family Immigrant to America, by Nicholas D. Garrett. To support this work, and have an influence, please visit patreon.com slash shipwrecked book. To purchase a copy for yourself, either in paperback or electronically, please visit amazon.com slash author slash Nicholas Garrett, search the book in the Amazon title bar, or purchase a copy at Pope's Creek, George Washington's birthplace, in Virginia. Thank you.